There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse. I'm your host, Chance, and I've got a fun, fascinating, and altogether fantastic feast of a show today, featuring our new friends from the Cosmic Keys podcast, Dan Shukas and Scarlett Ravenswood. It's always a good time when podcast hosts come together for a conversational collab, and thanks to Dan and Scarlett having me on their show not too long ago, we're already good and warmed up and stoked to enter the slipstream of synchronistic thinking and dive into some of the many interesting ideas this duo delves into on their show, including a lot of classic interverse subjects like astrology, tarot, and the convergence between the creative and spiritual paths. So go check out Cosmic Keys on iTunes or wherever you like to listen to podcasts and check out the episode I did with them. It won't be required to understand what we talk about here today, but it was a really good show. And if you're a Plus member on Interverse, you've probably already heard it because I uploaded the full session we did together to the Plus feed. And while last time we talked, they're interviewing me. This time it's all about Dan and Scarlett. Dan Shukas is a Chicago native and Renaissance man with a radical range of skills, including an astute affinity for astrology, but he's also a superb singer-songwriter that you can check out at his YouTube channel, Shook Daddy. As one half of the Cosmic Keys podcast, he brings his analytical skills to the show with weekly astro updates and prior week recaps, and he's even recently provided an Astrology 101 series of episodes to help you get a grip on the fundamentals of space weather forecasting. And as a novice myself, I found that quite enlightening. And of course, the counterpart to Dan's heady vibes on Cosmic Keys is the charismatic caster of charms, teacher of tarot, and professional pagan with an emphasis in Wicca, co-host Scarlett Ravenswood. As a public spiritual figure, Scarlett works one-on-one with clients to help them use metaphysical and divination tools to take the reins of their lives by learning more about themselves. She's a diverse and personalized coach with the wisdom to assist your fledgling business while at the same time showing you the symbolism present under the surface of your life, and her weekly tarot readings on Cosmic Keys podcast can help you learn the details of your deck one card at a time. You can find Scarlett's services at arcane-alchemy.com and on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at the same name, and you can subscribe to Dan and Scarlett's weekly show by going to cosmickeyspodcast.com. All of these links and more can be found in the show notes for today's episode, so help me make these two feel right at home on Interverse by connecting with them on social media and letting them know you appreciate them. One last thing before we dive in is a reminder that you can become an Interverse Plus member at patreon.com forward slash Interverse, and by joining for five bucks a month, you'll get access to the second hour of this show's interview and a huge archive of extended podcast episodes for you to peruse. And at the same time, you'll be supporting me with a little cash reciprocation for the time it takes me to put all this together. It's the plus people that keep the show going and help me get better gear, cover hosting expenses, and sometimes it pays for me to eat. So if you think making podcasts should be my real job and want to help me get there, sign up with the link in the show notes and join the tribe. I promise that if you love Interverse, then you definitely won't regret doubling the amount of show you get to hear. And at the end of the day, you can always cancel. So do us both a favor and check out Plus, because I'm sure this episode is going to be like most, and the juiciest gems will be in the second hour. But now it's time to get this star party started, so let's welcome the transcendental tutor of tarot and the supremely suave singing astrologer, Scarlett Ravenswood and Dan Shukas, to the podcast for their first visit. Thanks for being here, guys, and welcome to the Interverse. Wow. Well, thank you. We're so excited to be here. And thanks for that lovely intro. That was very nice. Yeah. Both of us are super flattered by that. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's all true. It's all true. You guys are really awesome. I'm really excited that our stars aligned, so to speak, to uh, find each other on Instagram as we did and now start collabing because even though it's your first time on the show and I've only been on yours one time, I feel 
pretty comfortable with you two, like like we're homies. <laughs> Maybe it's because we're about the same age. But let's let you guys introduce yourself as well, and not just use my uh, hyperbolic language. Yeah, I guess I'll go first. Uh, my name is Dan Shukas. Gosh, I mean, I've been a, a in the public eye, I guess, for astrology really since we started this show. Before that, it was all private. I would read my friends' charts you know, at bars from my phone and had a few friends that knew to reach out to me for help for stuff and was just always learning about it. And um, I met Scarlett in 2017 when I heard her on another podcast. She had already been established on YouTube and social media as like a, a spiritual public figure. And so we just became friends because of that common ground. And then, you know, in late 2018, we just kind of had the idea to start Cosmic Keys really spontaneously. And because it was so fun to do, it sort of just turned into its own thing. And we've been riding this wave ever since. So, Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I've been doing the whole tarot thing for a while. I started to get introduced to tarot, other divination methods, and paganism and witchcraft, that kind of stuff since I was a young teen. And so I've been kind of following along this journey for a while. And eventually, I was able to leave my normal corporate job and do this kind of stuff full time, do readings, lessons. And I was just really lucky to meet Dan. And we realized, you know, we both have these really fun skill sets of tarot and astrology. And we could kind of, with our forces combined, create a really fun podcast. So that's what we've been doing. And and our show is a weekly show. So we've been spending a lot of time exploring all these fun topics all centered around occultism and spirituality. Yeah, guys, definitely check out Cosmic Keys. It is super. Uh, if you were going to have Interverse on a podcast network, it would be on one that had a show like Cosmic Keys. I feel like <laughs> we have so much in common and uh, our, our subject matter definitely overlaps a lot. But what's extra cool is the astrological updates and weekly forecasts that you do. And also Tarot gets involved in there. So you both bring your skill sets to the table. And whenever I tune in and I actually catch it pretty timely, then I can always see the parallels. Or even if I think back at that time period, I can see the parallels between whatever the card was for that week or the the uh, astrological forecast for that week. So I was wondering what you guys have experienced with that. Like how much synchronicity do you get out of just making this podcast that wouldn't have even been necessarily there for you to notice without it? Well, it's totally changed <laughs> the way I experienced time. Um, because, you know, we, this is a weekly show that's time centered. I mean, astrology is time centered. It's basically just a, a sort of right brained way of working with time because you're just sort it's sort of like a complex clock in the sky and you're just, you know, observing the movement of it and whatever that means for you is very subjective, but like, yeah, I, I having the show has changed the way I think about just the week ahead, because, you know, every week is sort of a big deal. If every episode is associated with like the week ahead, even just writing the little blurbs on Instagram, it's like I wake up and it's kind of like the first thing I do is like, what's going on in astrology today? Cause I have an audience that would, would like to know. Um, but previously I, I was into astrology, but I didn't really have, like the responsibility to like inform people about it. So now it's just having the show has, I feel like helped me as an astrologer and also like, you know, I'm tarot. I love, and I have had a relationship with tarot for a while on a personal level, but Scarlett is definitely much more of an expert on tarot and lots of other subjects that, that I'm always learning about. So like when the two of us, have this show I'm learning a lot and like I feel like just doing the weekly forecast with the card of the week is an effective way to learn tarot and it's it's changed my perspective on what the cards actually mean in a in a big way yeah and it's kind of fun too because when you have the astrology forecast and you pull the tarot card of the week you kind of have this like baseline of things to be thinking about 
as the week progresses. So if you get, you know, kind of a, a tough card as the card of the week, um, when bad stuff happens, perhaps during your week, you can be like kind of calm because you, you know, like, well, I kind of figured something weird might happen this week. So for me, it's really kind of helped me de-stress a little bit. Like, okay, I'm aware of the astrology. I'm aware of the tarot with this forecast. And, you know, maybe some of this stuff will happen. Maybe it won't, but at least I can, you know, be aware so that when certain things happen, it's, it's not as big deal. It's not as much of a shock. Um, so yeah, it's definitely allowed me, like Dan said, to be more connected with time as well especially with astrology, because we are aware of the moon cycles. We are aware of the planetary movements. And we're also aware of just kind of the seasons because we're always talking about, you know, as we're transitioning now from Libra season to Scorpio season, how that connects with us in our life, but also where we live here in Chicago and as the weather changes. So it, it kind of does slow down time in a way. Oh, well, Chicago is definitely a place where you got to pay attention to the weather. I think think you could freeze to death out there sometimes. So what is cool about what you're saying is it's almost like you're taking a little bit of the impact out of the emotional climate that we all travel through as a single universal consciousness experiencing itself subjectively through infinite perspectives. And you can start to see those maybe even what you call trigger points as being more like Okay, it's raining today. I'm not going to get mad just because it's raining. I'm not going to hold on to resentment about the fact that it rained today, even though I wish it would be sunny. You can treat maybe like your own emotional flows in a similar way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think so. Um, so, for example, whenever you have like a hard ha aspect happening in astrology that maybe has to do with relationships. So during that week, you know, maybe if you feel yourself starting to get in an argument, it kind of allows you knowing that to temper your emotions a little bit and not get as worked up into something that you might regret. Or if it's something really positive, you know, so maybe like Thursday is a day that's going to be great for creative pursuits, then maybe that is what's going to inspire you to carve out a couple hours to, you know, make some music or do a little painting. Um, so it's neat how it kind of helps inspire and also kind of helps you feel a bit calmer about your week ahead. Absolutely. Uh, one thing that comes up a lot recently over the past few months is the cycle of our personal energy and how there's sort of peaks of creative ability and then a recession of maybe the drive or desire to express or to create. And it seems that at least a couple of artists I've spoken to have gotten a really good grasp on that and become they're really prolific, but they also find all this time to just be themselves or to relax or do nothing for, for lack of better uh, alternative. And that's, I think that that's really interesting connection to Wicca because what little I know about that tradition of folklore and magic is that it does heavily follow the moon and it does heavily play into the energy of the seasons to invoke some of the positive changes and manifestations in the practitioner's life. Is that correct? Oh yeah, definitely. It's all about, in my view, reconnecting with nature and the cycles within ourselves and the world around us. So I find that, you know, at least before I was, you know, doing all of this kind of most days, and I had like kind of a normal nine to five job. To me, it really seemed like the days blurred together so much and it got to be kind of a bit depressing. And then when I kind of reestablished my connection with, you know, Wicca, it forced me to notice again, the subtle changes of the seasons and also start to like look forward to certain seasonal things. So it didn't seem like life was so monotonous and boring because I was more attuned, more connected to the various cycles of, of nature and the planets and everything else going around us. And it definitely helped me in a spiritual level, but also just in a practical way too, I think. So Dan, I have a question for you that kind of plays off of this. I've had a theory to start off with about Saturn and some of its, I guess, effects on us as people that there's two different types of time that we can experience. And one is sort of the 
inverted Saturnian or the negative, the Kronos style Saturn energy of cycles like Scarlett's talking about, where you're kind of doing the same thing from day to day for a long period of time and it all blurs together. And it's like you're in a time loop, like you're just your wheel, your wheel spinning and the real time, I guess, instead of the artificial or the matrix time is your personal spiritual development or evolution as a being that is separate from the ego identity character that might be in a type of loop. So my question is, because this is what I've observed, do you think that there's any connection to like any aspect of your physical health or bodily health that is ruled or connected to Saturn that getting better shape in might help you get out of time loops or <laughs> sort of like the, uh, the rat race jail that people get into? Yeah, absolutely. When you think about Saturn, each planet basically has, you know, a light side and a shadow side and Saturn and Mars from the traditional Hellenistic point of view were the two malefic planets um, and Venus and Jupiter are the two benefic planets. So the, two, you know, Saturn being anciently referred to as a malefic, you know, when you think about the symbolism of, of Saturn and you think about the human condition in this reality, like we are all restricted and we're restricted specifically to our bodies and like the fact that we are embodied creatures, like you're saying, it captures us in this time matrix. And, you know, as long as you're an embodied incarnated human being, you're stuck with that reality. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> like, there's no way around it. You have to eat, you have to sleep, you have to, you know, have sex, you have to like do the human carnal stuff whether you like it or not. And, you know, to try to be really, really escapist, there are certain traditions that are like that. You know, a lot of Eastern traditions are, you know, like ignore the body, ignore the physical and just, you know, transcend all of it. And there is some, you know, that, that can be a spiritual path for some people, but either way, you're still an, an embodied creature. And the lessons of Saturn, like, you know, if any, if any planet in the Zodiac is going to be your worst enemy, it's probably going to be Saturn. You're more likely to make best friends with the nice planets like Venus or Jupiter. Saturn is usually going to make your life difficult, but that's sort of the game that we're in. That's sort of like the, it's like the game of Saturn. Like you have to be limited. You have to have this like weight on you. But that's sort of like if you if you look at life as sort of like a game, it's like that's just one of the rules of the game. So, yeah, as far as like being stuck in the matrix, Saturn will certainly make sure you're stuck right here in this Maya. But, you know, if you make friends with Saturn, it, it helps you like accept that you are embodied. It, it helps you accept that this is temporary. If you believe in that, that, you know, you are you are a divine spark and you have, you know, a much higher, your, your higher self or your like spiritual soul is, is not limited to this body, but right here today, because you're living and breathing, you're in Saturn's matrix. So if you sort of learn to work with Saturn, um, it's, it's easier to, to keep things like compartmentalized, I guess. So yes, Saturn is a malefic. He's old father time here in keeping you in this prison. But if you, if you came here to play this game, that's just the rules of the game, I guess. So when it comes to making friends with Saturn, do you think that basically like involves pursuing attributes that are given to the positive side of Saturn in your own self? Yeah, well, when you think of Saturn, so all the 12 signs of the Zodiac have rulers, they have planets that rule them. And Saturn rule is the ruler of Capricorn and Aquarius. Capricorn is an Earth sign and Aquarius is an air sign. Um, and even symbolically, they're opposite of when you look on the, the wheel, Capricorn is opposite of Cancer, which is ruled by the moon. And uh, Aquarius is opposite of Leo, which is ruled by the sun. 
So the sun and the moon are the two luminaries that rule the, the months of the year where the sun is and the light is most powerful. And Saturn being like old, cold father time rules the two coldest months of the year, which is Capricorn and Aquarius. And when you ask like making friends with Saturn, you know, there is Capricorn being Saturn's turf is an earth sign. And the symbolism is, you know, a goat ascending to the top of the mountain. And so a goat, when you think of like the animal totem is persistent, patient, cold, very earthy. Like I can't think of a more earthy animal than like a mountain goat. It just looks like the earth element, you know? If you're trying to do, if you're trying to accomplish something in this life, like you, Chance, have your show and you're like reaching an audience, you're spreading, you know, this spiritual message and, you know, reaching people's ears. You and I both know that to make that work takes a lot of hard work. You know, podcasts, you don't just like flip a switch and start talking and flip it off and it's, it's out there for everybody nice and clean. It's like, you have to, you have to edit things. You have to deal with like tech issues. You have to do the social media thing. And that's like hard work. And if you're like, well, that's how, you know, in this 3d reality, how I spread my spiritual message and I'm willing to take on that, that work. So being friends with Saturn is being okay with not instant gratification. It's being okay with the long the long-term view of things, you know, time, it's, it, Saturn is related to time and death and sort of like restriction because we are restricted. Like you wouldn't have a show if you didn't become friends with Saturn, you know? That totally jives with kind of my understanding of it as well, that the disciplined element of Saturn and the kind of ordering and authoritative side will actually give you strength if you're being your own authority or letting truth be the authority is a better way of putting that as opposed to like, like whenever you're at the whim and mercy of external authorities in the form of other humans, you tend to experience a lot of the negative taskmaster sides of the Saturn experience in life. And then the personal sovereignty you can get through personal responsibility and personal discipline is like your reward from that part of yourself in a way, like a, like a father that finally lets you drive the car once you washed it enough times or you're old enough or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And even like the symbolism of Saturn, you know, you think of the symbolism of Kronos that, that is nasty energy. It's like controlling. He's, he literally eats his children because he, he doesn't want to be overthrown by them. He it's all about, limitation. So when you're talking about the themes of like, you know, slavery or like control or fascism, that's still in the the category of Saturnian energy. And I'm not saying that's a I'm saying that is a bad that is a bad thing. And yeah, there's Saturnian symbolism and control hierarchies around the world too. Yeah, exactly. You can that's a big rabbit hole to go down <laughs> Saturnian symbolism with corporations and governments. Right. And, you know, that's the side of Saturn that you have to keep an eye out for and know that, you know, just because you're limited in a, in a body in this incarnation does not mean that you're a slave or does not mean that you're um, in ch- real chains. Like you, you work with and against Saturn in your own way. But at the end of the day, you know, there are still rules to this game and, and that is still in the category of S- Saturn, I guess. Yeah. And this is a question that I'll shoot to Scarlett, but you might have thoughts on it too, Dan. When it comes to making friends with a planet, are there any types of ceremonial or ritual practices that could help you gain favor or reduce the impact of something that might be in the cards for you coming up? Um, there's... I know in the occult, all kinds of correlations between each planet to different colors and parts of the body and different plants and trees and animals. So do you have any experience with that side of the Wiccan experience, Scarlett? Oh, yeah, there's there's a lot you can do. And within Wicca, people tend to focus on deities, specifically from like 
the pre-Christian pantheon. So we know with our planets, they're all named after Roman gods and goddesses. So you can use the, the name of the planet, or you can even take like the Greek name. So for example, if you want to establish a connection to the planet Venus, uh, who is in deity terms, the goddess of love and beauty. Yeah, you could definitely do a ritual or even a spell in honor of Venus and kind of ask that planet or that planetary energy to enter your life, bringing in more beauty into your life. So doing something like a ritual bath in honor of Venus could be a fun thing to do. Um, you can embrace... so. On the opposite side, say you need that boost of energy, well, calling upon that Mars energy <laughs> could be very useful. So maybe, you know, Mars uh, lighting a red candle, meditating on the flames, uh, really focusing in on bringing in that inner fire, that inner spirit to help kind of fuel your day or fuel your week so that you have enough energy. So there's a lot of kind of fun things that you can do. The only difference is that in at least the Wiccan perspective, usually you're referring to the planets and visualizing them more as the deity itself than the specific planet, but it's all the same energy that you're working with. Totally, totally. Like you could use Mercury to get a better memory <laughs> or if you're about to go on a journey. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Or even like with Mercury, if you have like a little statue of the god Mercury and you have it on your like work desk, <laughs> that would work really well because he's the god of communication. You're sending emails all day. Or maybe you have him as your like desktop image. So kind of just infusing that positive communicative energy into your work day, I think could be pretty useful. So, okay, I've got a serious curveball question for you, but I don't know who else to ask. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I've been thinking about lately in relation to this concept of gods and planets or archons. There's so many different names for these forces in different occult schools. But I just played this video game that had a plot about a pantheon of gods, just like the Hellenistic pantheon, but just a different, you know, fictional, fictionalized version of similar concepts. You know, their attributes were mixed up differently, but Collectively, they covered all the bases. And the big twist in this plot was that these gods were actually uh, originally mortals or humans that ascended to godhood and constructed the entire reincarnation process through technology and actually are used like mythology that existed already in their world to sort of create egregore like entities or spiritual energy conglomerations that absorb the uh, attention and the worship of religious followers in the world to grow in power and influence in the physical. So if you're following me, I was wondering if you think that there's any possibility that what we experience as the archonic energy or the gods is not necessarily, or even the reincarnation process and kind of being stuck on earth and not looping out to other planets very often you think that there's some artificiality to that? Like, does any of this resonate at all? Because it's a fictional story, but I always get some of the wildest ideas from fiction. So who knows? Yeah, it reminds me of uh, American Gods by Neil Gaiman. Have you heard of that book? It's also a TV show out. In I have heard of that. It's It's got a similar concept, right? That the gods require the attention and energy and worship of humanity. But in that concept... They sort of like converted themselves to corporations. And that's why the symbolism we see in corporations relates so heavily to these astrological concepts and whatnot. Is that right? Yeah, it's it's pretty much like a, a great battle is taking place between the old gods and the new gods, which are technology and media. Um, and the idea that whatever we give our attention to and our worship to, that gains strength. So yeah, that sounds like a similar idea. And it is interesting. It almost makes me think of what you were talking about, like that whole debate of are we living in a simulation <laughs> as well, too. I'm a bit worried about all of that kind of stuff. But yeah, there's a lot of, of interesting thoughts when you think about how uh, tr like traditional religions 
for example, are decreasing in popularity, you know, maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, but people do seem to be directing a lot of attention that they might have previously directed in a spiritual way towards spending time in a more technological way or, or, you know, spending more time with entertainment and watching TV or or doing other stuff. So yeah, there has been kind of a, a, a shift that I've noticed in the world as, as people kind of um, leave religion and move maybe more towards uh, materialism. And then there's a lot of people that do leave religion, but are moving more towards generalized spirituality, not necessarily in a religious sense, but just trying to connect spiritually with whatever they can. Maybe that's through yoga, maybe it's through like meditation, but nothing in a really formal way. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure. What are your thoughts, Dan? Well, what you asked got me thinking of, you know, the the tradition of Gnosticism, which is basically, it's, I guess it's like a uh, ancient Christian sect that viewed reality as very prison-like and thought that human humans really, their true origin was something way different than this that was much more pure and we're sort of just trapped here and the archons are these forces that keep us enslaved (laughs) and part of me is gnostic in that way because i think there is some truth to that um and even astrology you know astrology it, it for me it's one of those things that you just pay attention to and wait for the wait to see how it unfolds. And, um, you know, the more I work with it, the more I see that there is certainly something to it. And it, like you said earlier, it is the weather forecast, but you know, are the planets, the archons is, is a, actually kind of a common question because, you know, like it, it makes sense in a lot of ways. And even in ancient times, I've heard the argument that, um, a big, selling point for Christianity was that it broke you free of the influence of these planets. Cause back then before telescopes, I mean, they thought the planets really were just deities up in the sky. And, um, but are the planets, the archons is a tricky question. They can, they can act in that way, but you know, even in sort of like medieval traditions, all the the seven planets are all associated with archangels. So when you th- are thinking from a Gnostic perspective, like who are the archons? Are they archangels? Are they um, deities? Are they like, they're clearly doing work to control us or to influence us. But I think the human experience is like, I, I just keep going back to the video game analogy. Like we're here, we have this avatar and it ain't going to be easy. And sometimes it ain't going to be fun, but like we're in this game and our, our divine self, our higher self, our true nature is the one playing the game and our avatar or whatever, our, our incarnation, our nativity, our natal chart is what we do while we're here. So like, I don't, I don't think it's, good to like worship the planets but to work with them or to sort of like have to work to to be in harmony with their movements so that like your true purpose as a soul or whatever you're like dancing in this dance with these planets because one way or the the other they're going to influence you but like the the big challenge is like how on track can you stay with all these ebbs and flows of fate and fortune, I guess. That's a great answer. <laughs> That's really good. I think the, I mean, both of you, I love the perspectives you bring to this question because a lot of truth seekers and spiritual sojourners wind up in the Gnostic literature or people talking about Gnosticism and it's like, oh my God, we're in a prison planet. Oh my God, we're enslaved. Uh, well, you could also look at it with the same exact set of evidence and data as these things being teachers, like the, the planets are, or the archons are, like you said, also angelic forces in the right light. And 
if we just look at our individual selves and think about our shadow selves, our shadow actually is what drives us to evolve and become a, a better version of ourselves. Unless we get attached to whatever thing is com- is being rep- attached to repressing something into our shadow and not allowing it to express and evolve and metamorphosize, then you know, then we get the disciplinarian elements of these forces coming in, just like you can correlate them to your organs. If you were doing something like eating nothing but Reese's peanut butter cups for 90 days, you're probably, your organs are probably going to be like, all right, we got to give you some trouble now because you need to learn that that's not balanced. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, all of this, and I'm by no means like an expert in alchemy, but like the medieval tradition of alchemy First of all, it uses the Zodiac and the seven traditional planets like heavily. So, I mean, honestly, when I started looking into alchemy back in the day or hermeticism, I sort of was like, okay, alchemy uses these same symbols as astrology. So, therefore, these symbols are important to know. And there's multiple applications to use them. I mean, like, like if you're doing plant alchemy, it's like you're using herbs that are in this astrological like categorization system. If you're doing metal alchemy, there's metal for the planets or the signs or whatever. But the big thing with alchemy is like getting from like the negredo stage, which is like, you know, the blackening where all the shadow stuff has to come out. Cause like, and so, and then it's transmuting that shadow into gold or whatever. So like that's, I think the basics of alchemy is a really good metaphor for our experience here because like we've all got some shit under the surface surface and like, how do you become a better person? How do you fix that? Well, you can't fix it by leaving it unaddressed. The whole process is like bringing it up, working with it and changing it. So that's sort of like the karmic perspective I have too, that like, you know, even if it was in this life or any other life, if you have negative karma, it ain't going to go anywhere until you like work through it and repeat it yourself and experience, re-experience it yourself. And um, yeah, like alchemy just with the shadow work and everything is a, is a really good metaphor for like what we're talking about here. Scarlett, you probably have seen this type of dynamic that he's describing play out with clients in your uh, work as a coach and a tarot teacher and the things that you do. Can you talk about that at all? Yeah. As a tarot reader, I find that our sessions are often very therapeutic Um, and I'm not a registered therapist by any means, but it's really a way to use the cards and the sacred symbolism within them as launching off points. And they're going to resonate with the person you're doing the reading for, they might resonate either consciously or subconsciously. And it really opens the doors to have a deep and meaningful discussion about their life. And one of the things I'm fascinated by is I think a lot of people who get tarot readings are really just searching for a new way to experience the situations in their life, and they're looking for someone to talk to. And I think in general, we have a loneliness epidemic among our generation of millennials and especially the generation below us, Gen Z. And I think that a lot of people aren't necessarily wanting to talk to someone in a clinical way, um, but want to connect with themselves in a spiritual sense, but also at the same time, getting a second opinion on what they're going through, having someone just listen to them. Honestly, a lot of people just want to be listened to. So I run into to that a lot where people just, just really enjoy the experience because, you know, we're taking a whole hour to dig deep and, and talk about their feelings and help plan out what decisions they might want to make or where they want to go with life. And the cards and the sacred symbolism is really just a way to help them tap into those inner regions of themselves and, and find out what they really want to know. Um, yeah, so so it, it definitely 
is interesting being a reader. And I feel like I hold the secrets of like a thousand people (laughs) can't share them, but, um, but I'm happy to be a confidant to people. And Dan, you said that you've played the astrologer privately for a while. So I guess the same thing holds true for you that you can relate to creating sort of a non-judgment zone for somebody to just bring something out to the open that they've had bottled in and what a huge effect that can have to helping them emotionally heal. Yeah. And astrology, um, you know, the first real breakthrough I had was with a professional astrologer learning my own chart because he took, I mean, he basically took like some very key themes in my life in my, in my life and um, put astrological symbolism to it. And it just like hit me very hard and resonated with me very strongly. So like it's ever since I had that experience, like I'm trying to recreate that with people. Like I'm looking at this chart and they're just sitting there and I'm just like, okay, I see this thing. It might mean, a, it might mean B, it might mean C. And when I just, let's say whatever C is, they're like, wait, that that's totally true. How did you know that? You know, so you're sort of just like in a way, and this is like probably a huge critique of astrology is like, oh, it's like confirmation bias or whatever, or you're like cold reading people. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of am cold reading people. I'm listing off the cookbook symbolism themes from their chart. And then when I see, Oh God, how did you know that when they respond, you can kind of feel it. I'm like, Oh, okay, this is a hit. Let's explore it deeper. And the thing that works best about birth chart readings is like, once you get the hit, you, me as the astrologer, I'm like, I have, I sort of give the diagnosis. It's like, and usually the diagnosis is like, you know, this is going to be a lifelong thing for you. And whenever you get triggered by this thing, you've got to know that, that it's here with you and you either work with it or it works against you. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, me as the, the astrologer, I want people to be as vulnerable as possible and as revealing as possible. Cause I'm, I'm, I have a non, I'm coming from a place of non judgment for sure. And you know, any therapists should have the same attitude. Like it's not about judge judging the other person or, or like being shocked by their secrets. It's like the, the end goal is to help people. And it's super rewarding when you just feel that something clicked. You just feel that like you, you got to hit you, you were a successful astrologer for the day. And then they t- take that and work with it themselves. and. You know, it's it's just a good tool for uh, self reflection and for you know adding a symbolic language that uses the four elements, that uses yin and yang, and sort of like like you decide what your chart means to you. I'm not telling you what you are. It's I'm telling you the themes that you choose to resonate with or or choose to use yourself. So it's kind of a whole a whole lot of stuff in in one. I think it's awesome. Cosmic keys is a good metaphor for what astrology and tarot can be for a person that even on like a circumstantial basis, like they don't even study it themselves. Like you said, having a breakthrough the first time you had a professional read your chart. I remember a similar experience. It's it's pretty mind blowing (laughs) to just see yourself laid out like that and go, well, even if this was a coincidence that it was in my chart that I have this behavior or this attitude, the fact that there's 30 other things that completely correlate and uh, none of none of this stuff that doesn't vibe because, you know, you look at your sun sign on a dime a dozen website and that's how you check out. And you're like, what's my daily horoscope? That wasn't even really the intention of astrology in the past. Like horary astrology is a whole different thing. And it's interesting, you guys do get into the predictive side a little bit with your weekly forecast, but it's almost more just like you're talking about tendencies of energy and then whatever happens could be a myriad of things, but it is applied to that template to examine it by. But 
While we're still on the topic of this amazing phrase that I've never thought of or heard before, but is really a thing these days about spiritual public figures, which you guys both are. And I guess I guess I get, would consider myself that, too, at this point. And a lot of our audience is either that or working towards that. What do you think about the rise of this as a concept and as an element of our society? Is it a symptom of the Aquarian onset? Yeah, I I think it really is. I mean, more and more people are searching for meaning as our world becomes increasingly tech dominated and focused. Um, people want something that hits the part of themselves that is more meaningful and and spiritual in a way. So I think more and more people are gravitating towards spiritual moments. And it's kind of a weird thing, at least from my perspective, I consider myself a practicing pagan. So there aren't any like full-time clergy in paganism. It's not like I can just join a monastery or become a priest and minister. So you have all these people that are deeply spiritual and want to dedicate their life towards that, but there actually isn't an infrastructure to make that happen. There is no hierarchy, which on the one hand is great and that's awesome. And that's in part why I was drawn to it. But at the same time, you know, there's no support system either. So you have all these pagans that I know that have kind of just figured out a way to make this their life. And thus they kind of become public spiritual figures. But yeah, it is such an odd contradiction in terms. But I think it's in part just because we have to figure it out on our own. We have to use the tools we have like social media, like building a website or creating a podcast because deep down, this is what brings our life satisfaction. And we have to kind of figure out a way for our own sanity to to keep it going, to keep doing it. Uh, I love this whole movement because it's like decentralized spirituality. I think that's really important. It's been asking the white coat or the white robe or the black robe or whatever the costume is for the answers that has had us chasing our own tails for so long, really. And well, while we're still in the free hour, though, I do want to switch gears. We'll return to some of these topics in the plus extension for sure. But I wanted to make a little bit of space for Dan to talk about your music because I was floored whenever I heard Wake Me on your YouTube channel. It had all this really cool astrological occult symbolism, but not in a way that was like heavy handed. It was just it was almost just like the basics. There was some themes in the imagery of the video related to Aries, which I love as an Aries and the uh, song itself. It's called Wake Me. So it represents like this beginning of the day, this really cool start of a journey. And you'd mentioned it being part of a concept album. So really, I want you to talk about music in general, like what your history with creating music is like, what what do you do on the side with that? It it seems like you're really skilled, man. Well, first of all, thank you for checking it out and giving that awesome feedback. Um, so it's it's like, where do I begin with this? Like, basically, my journey in, into music is a spiritual journey for sure. I mean, my my journey into to owning the label as artist is super um, long winding and, you know, related to a lot of st stuff in my chart. My chart basically has a pretty heavy square between, you know, Scorpio and Leo. Leo is a very, very creative performance oriented um, stage oriented sign. And Scorpio is a very dark, mysterious and sort of self-critical sign. So just the conflict, the inner conflict of, you know, owning the label of, of of artist is something that I always am dealing with. Even to this day, if I, you know, I have some stuff on YouTube, I have stuff on Spotify, but am I a real artist? Like, am I making a career out of it? You know, so there's always that self-critical side, but basically my journey to being an artist really is a spiritual one because when I was in college, I had a really traumatic injury. It was a snowboarding accident where I broke three vertebrae in my neck and had, you know, sort it wasn't like a traditional NDE at all, but post 
surgery and like immediately after I had very mystical, you know, heavenly divine experience, like making me think like, Hey, you're still here. You didn't die. Now you got to make the most of your life because this ain't no joke. So it was sort of like a confrontation with death in a way. And, you know, post injury, I had a lot of very shadowy stuff come up in my life. You know, it was the early 20s, you know, depression, people around me dealing with very dark substance abuse issues, which was quite prevalent. I had a, I had plenty of shadows from my like childhood and teen years, but at the end of the day, I lived a great life. And had I not been like, you know, burst open by this trauma, I might've, that might've remained in the background and I would have been like a, you know, a normal person, but like facing this set of shadows was like a rabbit hole to all the other ones. But, you know, at the end of college, after being like sort of depressed and, in chronic pain, I discovered yoga, which this was in 2010. So it was like right before yoga became very mainstream. Like now it is white chick, you know, in yoga pants on in every town, everywhere it's mainstream. But back then it was like, do dudes do yoga? This is so weird. Like I was so self-conscious, but basically I had like, you know, it was like a massive, massive spiritual awakening moment. And I had, I had a book basically fall off the shelf in a bookstore, which was the secret teaching of all ages by Manly P hall, you know, the Zodiac alchemy. Watch out. If that falls off a shelf, that could knock you out. Exactly. And it was like, why the hell am I like marching to the back of the bookstore to this shelf and just grabbing this and knowing it's exactly what I need. I mean, that book like totally burst open my mind to all this stuff. And the yoga was like, finally, I was healing from all that stuff. And I like was so blissed out. And when I went to the free therapist, because this was during college, it was, I was in school at University of Colorado Boulder. And they, they give three free therapy to students because you pay so much in tuition. And you know, even that was taboo for me at the time, like, oh, only crazy people go to see a therapist. But basically, long story short, all of this drama, you know, sitting in the therapist room, she's like, how do you view yourself? And I was like, that's the dumbest question ever. I know the answer to this 100%. Like, why would you even ask? And it was like, the thing I said to myself is, well, I'm an artist. And like, you know, at the end of college, when you're finishing your economics degree and like, don't do anything creative, you're like, how the hell do I take this revelation that that's what I am and like do something about it? And I mean, that was, we're coming up on 10 years. So like for the past 10 years, I've been noodling around with lots of different things, but spirituality and creativity and making art and making music, it's all sort of following your bliss. And it's like, when you have that trauma where you're like life is important and sacred and being here is a, a gift. It's like, it's like if you treat it as a gift, you're not going to be in the rat race. You're going to live a really messy life trying to chase your bliss, I guess. And it's led me here to this conversation. And it's like, I'm, I'm super grateful warts and all for, for my, this path I'm on, you know? But yeah, I guess to to answer the original question, like music is just an extension of that, you know, like carving out time in this precious life to like, you know, feel closer to God or the divine or whatever. Man, that's an intense story. And one that mirrors several that I've heard of people that developed into really epic humans. So (laughs) it seems like the meandering of our individual paths always ends up being more of a unified direction than we ever realized because we'll be the more interest we follow, the more ways we'll see that they can converge into what we have to bring to the world that is uniquely ours as a gift. I'm sure that's the same for you too, Scarlett. And I wanted to check with you about how you feel about this entire massive connection between creativity and spirituality. I I see it as a really big important thing and maybe one of the most important themes of the entire reason I make this show actually 
because whenever I was first exposed to what most of culture considers spirituality in the form of like, you know, Christian church, creativity was not on the agenda there at all. There was no connection between creativity and spirituality. But for me, I think that's like paramount. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I am really lucky to be able to pursue creative pursuits as part of doing everything that I'm doing right now. I've always been a very visual person and I was interested in photography in in high school and a little bit in college. And now I still love to do photography. And a lot of people, you know, rag on like Instagrammers and YouTubers for a lot of good reasons. But at the same time, it's amazing that I'm able to kind of do like photo shoots take interesting photos and share it with people and take photos that I find spiritually meaningful or use a photo to help describe a spiritual concept or an aspect of tarot that I want people to understand and explore. So using photography to help bring about all of these fascinating spiritual discussions has been really fun. And even something like, I mean, as silly as making YouTube videos are, I mean, it's really fun learning how to edit video. And that's another creative pursuit that I never thought or pictured I would be doing. And I'm so grateful that I have that chance because I've always been an artistic person, especially growing up. And I always um, strive to bring beauty in my life and all its forms. And now I get to like spend my nine to five doing that. And that's been one of the most rewarding things about this whole journey And it's something that was clearly missing from my life when I had a normal office job. So it really has been life changing. Yeah, you just put a video about mold cider for Sam Hain, right? That's uh, something people could go check out, like a little witchy cooking video. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I'm a big fan of cooking. (laughs) So, yeah, that was fun. And I got to like kind of do a little artistic cooking video for Samhain coming up, which is um, Halloween for most people, but I celebrate it as a pagan holiday in remembrance of the dead. And mold cider is something I always love to make for this time of year. And I just want to budge in and say, you know, Arcane Alchemy, the the YouTube channel and the Instagram is totally art. (laughs) Like it's, it's literally, I mean, literally, because like to make videos any in podcasting is art too. Like people think, Oh, I'm not artistic because I can't draw photorealistic like shapes. And it's like, no, this is all art and this is all creative. And for you to have a YouTube channel or a podcast or a cool social media page is just as art as, you know, painting like, you know, a Renaissance face or something, you know, it is. Yeah. And it's neat with technology nowadays. We have so many more opportunities to be creative. I mean, you could be into graphic design or or video editing or all this kind of art forms that you couldn't do back in the day. So we just have so many more options now. I'm glad you said that because I was thinking the same thing. Just because whatever you're creating is a technological thing and not an analog technical thing. It doesn't take away the value of something that came from your imagination, your mind, and then you put it into reality. And at the end of the day, that's technology too. A paintbrush is technology too. It's like, do you want to tread ground that you've probably even done in past lives a hundred times by learning to be a a perfect realism painter? Or do you want to go somewhere totally new? And I'm not saying that someone shouldn't learn how to paint realistically, because maybe that is something that's new and you crave that. That's it's all there's nothing new under the sun. So everything that you create is equally new and not new. And you should embrace whatever form it comes in. I totally I totally agree. Both of you uh, do interesting things on Instagram visually as well. Like Dan, do you create those like vapor wavy collages that are with your astro updates, right? I curate them. Oh, you curate I've, I've made them. A, okay. Yeah, I've made a couple, but they're probably the shittiest looking ones. But um, I think it's a future goal, though. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I like I have, um, I guess, Adobe Creative Cloud. So like I would someday like to be better at it. But um, I actually find most of those images from Pinterest. And 
shout out to Pinterest too, as a guy, because people think it's like <laughs> all, people think it's all like really girly, but honestly, like all that vaporwave, like my Pinterest algorithm has really helped me build the Cosmic Keys, like Instagram aesthetic, but I do write, you know, and that's another thing that's good about this podcast is it's like, I get the platform to write daily astro forecasts for the day or whatever. And it's a good writing exercise to be like, all right, I should make a post today and I should write a paragraph because, you know, I was like an English major as well. And Hey, me too. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Yeah. English, English majors, a lot of them that I know just end up doing like very wide ranging projects because it sort of teaches you uh, a lot of stuff at once, but but writing is a, like it teaches you how to think analytically and how to use multiple modes of an analysis instead of being stuck in one mode. Like as much as I hated looking at stuff from say like a Marxist perspective, like the teachers would make you do in college, it's still useful to be able to think the way that all the sides think instead of just want your side. Yeah, I, I was really good at critical theory. Um, although <laughs> now I realize that it's all like sort of like political indoctrination in a way, but, uh-huh. um, I still, I still like reading stuff from, you know, those different perspectives. Cause, and, and it's, it's funny too, because like the skills you pick up being an English major being like, what does this symbolism mean in the great Gatsby? It's well, it's kind of like when you're an astrologer, it's like, what does the sim- symbolism mean this week in the sky? It's kind of the same process. Dude, you're right on the money because whenever I was in college as an English major and a creative creative writing major, specifically as my emphasis with no intention to become a writer <laughs> for a living, I was like, well, this is just to appease my parents. I thought I was just kind of drifting and wasting my time there. And now, like once the spiritual path kicked on for me, all of the skill set from writing papers and thinking analytically and all that communication, it just immediately translated into my own personal path. And that's kind of uh, an echo of what we were just talking about with you, Dan, and like how just getting into a wide variety of interests end up converging in ways that you'd never expect. We're basically at the exit door here time-wise. So I wanted you guys both to talk about your services, how people can access them, and then remind people where to get Cosmic Keys podcast too. Yeah, well, thanks again for having us, Chance. And I, I, one other show that I literally listen to every new episode is your show, Interverse. Um, I am like a, a real fan and I love what you do with your show and think you're a great host too. Like you always give the guests their time to finish their thoughts and everything, which you did to us today too, which is awesome. So thanks. Um, as far as our show though, and our, how to contact us, um, pretty much everything you can get from our website, which is cosmickeyspodcast.com. You know, right on the, the landing page, we will have the most recent episode linked. There will be ways to subscribe on all the other platforms. You can also uh, book readings with Scarlett or myself in our services section. Um, for social media, we're on Twitter. It's at Cosmic Keys 777. Instagram is at Cosmic underscore Keys underscore podcast. Um, and Scarlett has a YouTube that's really great, Arcane Alchemy. And what... Y- yeah, yeah. So I'm also on YouTube. You can just find me by typing in Scarlet Ravenswood. I'm on Instagram at Arcane Alchemy. And my personal website is arcane-alchemy.com. So I also, you know, write about tarot, write about spirituality. I have a blog. I do tarot lessons for people all one-on-one through Skype or in person if they happen to be in Chicago, but mostly through thing, platforms like Skype and Zoom. So um, I do that as well, but, but yeah, I think, I think that's it. Oh, and we're, um, we do giveaways a lot on our Cosmic Keys podcast. So we do giveaways at least usually once a month. <laughs> so that's another fun thing we like to do through that platform. Do you give away, give away readings? Um, we have 
done that, I believe, before. Uh, our recent giveaway is we're giving away two copies of the book, The Astrology of Love and Sex uh, by Annabelle Gatt. We had her on our show recently. So we're giving away a couple copies of her book. So we usually give away tarot decks and, and books and things like that. Man, that's a great idea. I should give away art supplies or something. <laughs> I, might, I might steal that. You guys are awesome. And thank you for the kind words, Dan. I am happy to have discovered your guys' the show as well uh, in the last year sometime. And the it's worth following you guys on Instagram for Dan's Astro updates on there for sure. And don't forget to check out YouTube. Uh, what's your YouTube called, Dan? Remind me again. It's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, if, so for my um, mu- I have two music videos. I'm about to film a third this this upcoming week, so getting ready for Crazy Town. Um, but uh, on YouTube, you can find me under Dan Shukas. My last name is S H U K I S, um, and that's also I have those two tracks on Spotify as well. And my Instagram for my art and stuff is at Shuk Daddy. So that's S-H-U-K-E-D-A-D-D-Y. And I'm working on ShukDaddy.com. I have, but it, there's nothing on it yet. It's under construction. So soon there will be a website as well. Awesome. So much exciting things to come for both of you, I'm sure. And definitely going to want to have you back. It's been a blast. Thanks for the time. And everybody, make sure that you go check out Cosmic Keys podcast for more of these two. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Chance. All right, my friends, thank you for making it to the end of the show and being here with me all the way at the outro. I really do appreciate you checking out Innerverse, and I think that you must have liked it because you made it this far, but I really liked it. Talking with Dan and Scarlett was a dream come true because we got to cover all the bases as far as the astrological and archetypical bases. I really enjoyed the discussion we got into about deities, gods, archetypes, because I really do fall into the camp of saying that all of this stuff in the metaphysical, spiritual world has to do with the psychological archetypes that are within ourselves, and that even people in your life are one way that you connect to deity or archetype or whatever. What happens is we have these traits inside of us that go unrecognized or sometimes unexpressed, and then they have to come at us from the external world so that they still exist because nothing really can go away. And whenever you get into tune with the inner voices of the archetypes, whether it's the sage, the warrior, you know, there's many of them, then you start expressing that in your life yourself. And then, then stuff really starts rolling for your, for you. (laughs) And there's also a complete Flip side of that, where if you are sort of imprisoning one of your archetypes within, you can make it demonic. You can, an unexpressed form of energy can become stagnant, right? So there's also the factor that sometimes these deities are wrathful in the way that they come at us because they're trying to break down whatever rigidity of our current structure is keeping them imprisoned and keeping ourselves limited. So Look at nature, for example, the whole Saturnian or I guess not Saturnian. It's more of a Pluto thing now in modern astrology. But like the whole decay and death thing that exists in nature is all about recycling that which is no longer playing its part for the rest of the ecosystem. So when it comes to feeling like we're even being, uh, I guess, assaulted by negative entities like poltergeist phenomenon, we got up to that in the plus extension a little bit talking about some of those type of experiences. And I think that those could be really your inner archetype, those slices of yourself that are now playing the role of the destroyer and the purifier because you are in such a stagnant place. Now, I think that there's maybe 
exceptions to every rule. There seem to be things like poltergeist and paranormal activity that isn't really a person's fault, but it's hard to know because you can't get into a person's psyche and know like what's repressed, you know, how they're oppressing themselves and what what's their trauma that caused that schism internally. And speaking of (laughs) uh, things that are imprisoned, you know, not only do we create our own demons, but we kind of create a demonic reality by thinking that we're imprisoned in reality or in our bodies. We talked about Gnostic thought a little bit in this episode, and the pros and cons of that would be that it's nice to want to become more liberated, more free, but it's not so nice to think that the whole world is a cage and that nature is somehow evil. And I think that type of thinking actually is leading to a lot of what we see in the ecological destruction of the world right now, that the world is a fallen place or that humanity has fallen. And yeah, that's dangerous. So beware of that. If you get into looking at Gnostic stuff or simulation theory or anything, just remember that your worldview is your choice. (laughs) It's going to kind of be true regardless of which one you pick. That is a paradox of the reality we're in. It's like the classic tale of the two Buddhist monks that are looking out over a a hill at a city or something. And one says, it's so awful. It's so terrible. And the other says, it's so beautiful. It's so perfect. Our suffering can definitely be a big catalyst to change. And yeah, Dan talked about that quite a bit in this one. So he had an experience of breaking his neck. Pretty crazy. I better tell you about the plus extension though, before I get too much further. So if you're not Oh, aware Interverse Plus is where you can double up the show content, get a second hour of each interview by becoming a member at patreon.com forward slash Interverse for only five bucks a month. You get a huge archive of shows to dive into and you help support me to make podcasting my job instead of having to have a job and be a podcaster. It's kind of hard, actually. So in Plus this time, we discussed converging our varied skills and educations into our unique expression art history, symbolic literacy, and the origins of tarot, astrotheology, the origins of religion, and the hero's journey of the sun through the zodiac, how the qualities of the archetypes and deities are created and altered by mass human belief, the history of Wicca and its various forms of and beliefs, working relationships with deities, and the dangers of making magical contracts. Trickster spirits, egregorious gurus, and being careful with what you feed, psychologically especially. The connection between personal instability and paranormal or poltergeist activity. And then near the end, Dan and Scarlett shared some odd things about themselves that they've not told their audience before. And the duo also gave us their recommendations on their favorite paranormal and occult podcasts. So it was pretty damn awesome. And I don't know what's been up with the space weather other than Mercury retrograde, but we actually recorded this about a month ago, and it's taken me about a month to finally get it produced and put out there. And today was is the end of Mercury retrograde, <laughs> the 20th, as I record this outro, and it was like a switch was flipped. I don't know how else to describe it. This morning, I woke up and I could work on this more easily. And so here I am getting it out, but... There were many days where it could have been done and it wasn't done. And I'm sorry about that, but it was one of those retrogrades where I really needed to spend some time looking behind me instead of progressing forward. And in fact, it kind of felt impossible to have the energy to progress forward. I don't know. Maybe it's just that that time change thing and getting dark earlier, throwing me off in my circadian rhythms or whatever. But thanks for your patience on this one. I've got more episodes in the shoot ready to come out and we're done with that space weather that made it so tricky. So (laughs) and definitely want to remind everyone to check out Cosmic Keys once more. And that if you are a plus member to Interverse, you can get the plus episode of the Cosmic Keys episode that I was in on Interverse. So they also do a second hour on their show for their subscribers. And we're doing a little swap where they get for they're going to upload to their RSS feed the two hour version of this episode, just like they let me upload the two hour version of their episode to our plus feed. So thank you. Thank you, Dan and Scarlett for that. That's pretty cool. Hope to do that type of thing again with you guys in the near future. And 
I'm going to keep following your podcast. So thanks for being on. Thanks for the kind words that you said about Interverse at the end of the show there, Dan, also. And other ways that you all listening can help the show would be to leave a review on the iTunes podcast app, drop five stars, or even write something nice. I will read on the show, even if it's mean, and it'll be fun. Also, you can just share the show with anybody that you know in person. That's always great. Or post it on social media or something like that. And overall, of course, the best way to support the podcast is to become a Plus member. Because if I had just, you know, a thousand Plus members, which doesn't seem that crazy to get, I'd be set as far as being able to make this my full-time job. Think about it. You could get me there. Five bucks isn't that much. I would do it for you. Maybe if you were making something cool that I liked. (laughs) But anyway, thanks for being here and listening, even if you're on the free show. Definitely love you. And I'm going to play us out with a little bit of music by a recent guest of the show, Lucid. I have been sometimes not putting music at the end of the podcast because it gets kicked off Spotify, but I can't get this song Tango Line out of my head that uh, Dean McDonald, a.k.a. Lucid, recently put out on a new EP and I'm going to play it here because it is my current major obsession. So enjoy that. Go check out Lucid on SoundCloud. Go check out the episode Lucid did with us a few weeks back. I guess it's over a month ago now. It it was super different and funky and fun. So thanks again, everybody, for being here and we will talk soon. Much love and congratulations on surviving that last Mercury retrograde. It was a doozy. Sayonara. Bottoms up, man, tangle, mangle,